Well, thank you, Dr. Wood, and hello, everybody. Um, I have to apologize. I'm sorry for anyone who's disappointed not to see Lou Conkle standing up here. As many of you know, Lou was originally supposed to do this, and unfortunately, a few days ago, he came down with a nasty cold. Uh, but he was texting me just a few minutes ago to say that his fever broke last night and he's feeling better. So he sends his congratulations to our unnamed awardee uh, and his best regards to everybody. And sorry he can't be here, but hopes to see you all next year. Well, Dr. Wood, you actually um, perhaps stole my phrase, or maybe I'm stealing yours, but this is a tremendous dis and distinct honor and tremendous pleasure uh, to be asked to do the introduction for our MDA Legacy Awardee for this year. Dr. Jeff Chamberlain has been a stalwart of research and support for MDA for many years. I've known Jeff since 1989, when as a four-month-old fresh postdoc with Lou Conkle, I went to the American Society for Human Genetics meeting and saw a postdoc for Tom Kasky giving a talk about a new method called multiplex PCR. Jeff had developed this method to analyze uh, by PCR, the presence or absence of six exons of the dystrophin gene to rapidly identify deletions. For the past few months, I had been doing southern blots, and in fact, everybody else had been, developed by Tony Monaco. Uh, these were time-consuming, subject to artifact, uh, and difficult to interpret sometimes. And the PCR test was a real major step forward. So I went back to Lou's lab, we identified, we had maps of the dystrophin gene deletions in patients with Duchenne, and identified nine more exons and thought I would do Jeff one better by um, developing a complementary assay for nine additional exons within the, within the dystrophin gene. By the time I published that, Jeff had published as well, and not just his six exons, but in fact nine. So on the basis of that, the Chamberlain PCR test for dystrophin deletions became the predominant test for uh, clinical test for dystrophin uh, diagnosis for the next number of years. Since then, Jeff um, finished his postdoc with Tom Kasky, moved on to University of Michigan, where he was recruited by Francis Collins, uh, and started his work focusing on Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which forms the basis for this legacy award. Jeff's work over the years has basically laid the groundwork for the gene replacement therapies that we see coming online today. He's responsible for developing the concept of the first microdystrophin based on an observation from Kay Davies of a patient with a very large deletion. We suspect you'll be hearing about this in more detail from Jeff in a few minutes. He mapped the functional domains of dystrophin identified areas that uh, could be removed with minimal impact on the functionality of the protein. Together working with Steve Hauschka, uh, who I believe was also his former PhD advisor, uh, they developed novel promoters for the distro to be used for gene therapy that are in use today in a number of different clinical trials. And, um, and in fact, developed um, some of the first gene replacement therapy vectors. Uh, as director of the Wellstone Center in, um, in Seattle. So in fact, um, I'm gonna shut up at this point because I'm kind of coming to the end of my uh, prepared comments, but I just wanna say that all of this work has formed the basis for the clinical trials that are going on today. In fact, Jeff's construct was the basis for the Elevidis construct that was just approved for uh, gene therapy this last year. So with that, I'd like to invite our speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Chamberlain, uh, this year's MDA Legacy Awardee. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Alan, for that very kind introduction. and. Appreciate the overview of my career. Uh, MDA asked me to, to get up here and, and just kind of briefly summarize uh, what I've done in my life. Uh, after Alan's introduction, maybe I don't need to say anything more, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, they asked me to keep it brief, so hopefully uh, you'll indulge me for the next couple hours here. So um, <clears throat> what, it, what I want to do is uh, I'll, I'll try to go through semi-rapidly uh, various things. 
uh, that have been part of the work I've been involved with involving many, many other people. I'll try to mention uh, a, a couple of them today. Uh, but uh, together, uh, all these things have come together, I think, and uh, have, have gotten us very excited about the prospects for gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and many other neuromuscular disorders. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I can't really accept this award or, or talk about really anything I've done in my career without thanking the Muscular Dystrophy Association. They have played an incredibly important part in not only the development of my career, but also fostering my interest and encouraging me and uh, you know, making the resources available to, to do what we've done over the years. Uh, the, the, you know, I got my start, as Alan mentioned, as a graduate student many years ago with Steve Hauschka at the University of Washington. And in Steve's lab, uh, we were interested in just studying basic muscle development. Was, Steve was really at that time a developmental biologist. And you know, I was kind of surprised to find out from Steve that all of the work he was doing was supported by the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And at the time, we weren't really working on muscular dystrophy, but you know, that was before Lou Kunkel had identified the dystrophin gene. We didn't really know the cause of any of these disorders. And so MDA was trying to fund basic research to try to get us to the point where we could start developing treatments for these diseases. Uh, that uh, inspired me to go on and uh, uh, do my postdoc uh, with Tom Kasky, uh, who was, uh, had founded the Institute for Molecular Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. And I decided at that time, well, I wanted to learn a little more about human genetic diseases. So that's why I went to Baylor. And when I was at Baylor, I actually got my, the first grant that I had ever written in my life, which was an MDA postdoctoral fellowship. <clears throat> and it was very exciting at the time uh, because Don Wood, who was the uh, chief scientific officer at MDA at the time, was visiting Tom Kasky's lab and I met with him. And he is the one that personally told me I had just gotten an MDA postdoctoral fellowship. So I'll, I'll never forget that. Thank you, Don, for uh, letting me know at the time. Uh, Appreciate that. And then, of course, after I left uh, my postdoc and started my first lab at the University of Michigan, the very first grant that I was awarded as an independent PI was from the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and it was to begin developing gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, you know, many, many of the young people here probably uh, don't remember the uh, Jerry Lewis MDA Labor Day telethon. It was something that me and many people in my generation grew up watching. Uh, I got to know Jerry Lewis very well. I was on the telethon many times. There's a uh, a fairly recent photograph of the two of us together there. Uh, and uh, it's, Jerry Lewis was an incredible inspiration and raised billions of dollars for neuromuscular disease research. And MDA has continued to support me for more than 35 years. So thank you very much for that. So it all kind of goes back to my graduate work with Steve Hauschka. And the, my thesis project at the time was to clone the muscle creatine kinase gene and to begin to understand how it was transcriptionally regulated. Uh, and the reason we chose the uh, creatine kinase gene was that uh, it was uh, the, uh, one of the most abundant uh, proteins in muscle. We thought it would be, have a strong transcriptional and regulatory region. And uh, when, when we identified the gene, we in fact showed that it was transcriptionally regulated during muscle differentiation. Uh, the MCK gene is not expressed in satellite cells or in myoblasts, but upon commitment to terminal differentiation, the gene is transcriptionally activated and increases uh, its messenger RNA levels more than a thousand fold. Uh, soon after that, we identified the regulatory regions in the MCK gene and identified at the time the first muscle-specific enhancer element, which uh, was later used by Hal Weintraub and Steve Tapscott to identify the MyoD uh, transcriptional factor. Uh, Steve's lab, since then over many years, has gone on to use the MCK enhancer and promoter elements to develop more than 350 different muscle-specific expression cassettes, including the well-known MHCK7 and CK8 promoters that are used in a variety of different human clinical trials uh, today. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, after I left Steve's lab, I was recruited by Tom Kasky to start uh, learning about uh, molecular genetics. And uh, interestingly, so Kasky set me up to work on this project, which was maybe slightly ambitious, which is to try to use a recently described uh, mouse model called the MDX mouse and see if we could use that to try to understand uh, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and perhaps uh, get our hands on the dystrophin gene. So I had this uh, very interesting event in my career. When I left Seattle, I was uh, drove in my car, packed up everything I owned, drove to Houston to uh, start my postdoc. And halfway along the way, I stopped at a Keystone uh, meeting, which was on myogenesis in Park City, Utah. And uh, interestingly, the very final session of the meeting had these three speakers right here. And uh, Tom, who I was going to go work for, uh, got up first and talked about this newly described mouse the MDX mouse, and he was advocating that perhaps the MDX mouse was a model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Well, much to my surprise, uh, a scientist in the audience stood up, 
uh, this person shall remain nameless today, and started yelling at Tom Caskey and telling him he was a complete idiot and that everybody knew the MDX mouse could not possibly be a mouse model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So at that point I thought, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into here? And things just went downhill from there, of course, because then Ron Wharton got up and said he had just cloned out a translocation breakpoint from a female uh, who had Duchenne muscular dystrophy and that he thought he was right on top of the Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene. So I thought, oh my gosh, uh, you know, what, what am I gonna do now? And if, if that wasn't bad enough, then Lou Kunkel got up and basically announced that he had just cloned the, 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 the Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene. So at that point, I thought, I'm gonna get back in my car, turn around, and go do one of my other postdoc offers, which was to work on transcriptional regulation during cancer. Uh, but fortunately, Tom talked me out of that, and I continued on to Houston. And it turned out that actually, these events coming together were, were, were really a, a very beneficial thing for me, particularly because of the generosity of Lou Kunkel. So yeah, the fact that Lou had cloned the dystrophin gene really kind of saved my career, because I think the strategy that we had envisioned to try to get it ourselves would have never worked. Uh, but Lou had the gene, and he was incredibly generous. The, he and the people in his lab, Tony Monaco, uh, Alan Beggs, as you heard, and, uh, and Eric Hoffman, were very generous. They immediately sent uh, Tom and I clones that they had pulled out from the gene, and that allowed us to start working on the mouse dystrophin gene, and also start cloning out, uh, as Alan mentioned, some of the deletion hotspots from the human gene. So we continued to work on the MDX mouse, trying to characterize uh, that animal. We, uh, we originally mapped uh, the MDX gene uh, on the X chromosome and showed that it probably was indeed a mouse model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We then started looking at uh, expression of the dystrophin uh, in the MDX mouse and it showed for the first time that actually the dystrophin transcript was expressed in the central nervous system, providing the first link to the cognitive deficits in, in, in uh, some of the patients with DMD. Uh, we also showed that the uh, dystrophin messenger RNA levels in the MDX mouse were profoundly reduced compared to wild type. And based on that, we put forth a uh, hypothesis that the MDX mouse probably carried a premature stop codon uh, in the gene, and that was responsible for the lower messenger RNA levels. And in fact, that prediction was borne out, uh, found to be true uh, almost five years later when the uh, MDX mutation was found in exon 23 of the dystrophin gene. Uh, we then uh, went on and put together the first full-length dystrophin cDNAs based on the mouse cDNAs that we had pulled out. <coughs> As Alan mentioned, uh, sort of in, a, in our spare time, <coughs> we were busy cloning out uh, some of the deletion hotspot regions of the gene. And uh, uh, what, what, the way that that came about was that uh, Tom Caskey was on the scientific advisory board at CETUS, which is where Kerry Mullis worked when he discovered the polymerase chain reaction. And of course, Kerry went on to win the Nobel Prize for that discovery. Uh, and right soon after that, Luke Uncle had shown uh, right after he cloned the gene, that many of the patients had very large deletions. And so that set up uh, uh, a lot of dilemmas on how to, how to really go about doing diagnostics. And Kerry Mullis came out and visited us uh, in Houston and talked about PCR and suggested we try applying it to the Duchenne muscular dystrophy locus. And so Tom Caskey put me on that project and we, and, uh, we had a, a young scientist in the lab named Joel Rainier who uh, was really the one that did all the hands-on work on developing this PCR. We cloned out a lot of these hotspot regions of the gene, developed this multiplex PCR method, and were able to diagnose about half of all cases of Duchenne muscular dystrophy in a matter of hours rather than uh, sometimes weeks that it took previously. And uh, turns out Joelle was such an incredible scientist that I ended up having to marry her. So. <laughs> The, uh, so uh, soon after that, I got my first position uh, at the University of Michigan. I went to the Department of Human Genetics uh, with Francis Collins, and uh, we decided to take uh, the, the uh, continue our study of the MDX mouse and use it to try to un uh, understand what this dystrophin gene did. And so one of the first things we did, I had a very talented graduate student, Greg Cox, was the first graduate student I ever had, and uh, we made transgenic animals uh, expressing the full-length dystrophins we'd pulled out in this uh, uh, MDX mouse model. And uh, of course, you know, how do you, if you're gonna make a transgenic mouse, you need a good promoter, enhancer element to drive expression. So of course we chose the MCK gene. We used a six and a half KB regulatory fragment from the MCK gene that I'd cloned out as a graduate student. We made these transgenic animals and it turns out the very first line we made had incredibly high levels of dystrophin. We characterized it. This is a Western blot here. You can barely see this little band there on the left is the wild type dystrophin present in wild type muscle. And to the right of that are dilutions from these transgenic animals. They had about 50 times wild type levels of expression. <clears throat> in fact, it's the highest expression I've ever seen. And in fact, it was so high on the left here is a Kumasi stained gel. And this little band 
right here, if you can see it, is dystrophin. So to my knowledge, this is the only time that anyone's been able to see dystrophin actually on a Kumasi gel, uh, just from its normal expression levels. Uh, these mice turned out to essentially be absolutely cured of muscular dystrophy, uh, which is a little surprising because we used a very uh, highly muscle-restricted promoter to drive dystrophin expression. And at the time, we sort of thought that you would probably need expression in nerves or in glial cells, uh, or, you know, uh, uh, Schwann cells, other cells, but we were able to eliminate all of the muscle symptoms of this mouse simply with a muscle-specific expression. Uh, this also led to the beginning of a lot of collaborations with other laboratory, with Kevin Campbell stepped in and volunteered to look at the dystrophin glycoprotein complex in this mice, and his lab was able to show that we had restored the entire dystrophin glycoprotein complex, uh, and this led to uh, uh, years and years of collaborations with Kevin Campbell, uh, who's been a, just a tremendous mentor for me throughout my entire career. Uh, we also started working with another uh, mentor of mine, John Faulkner, who's really, I consider, the, muscle of father, uh, the father of muscle physiology. John went on to characterize a variety of physiological properties and contractile properties in these mice and showed that they were completely back to normal. So this kind of set in motion uh, uh, our thought that, well, maybe we could actually develop gene therapy for muscular dystrophy since we've cured the MDX mouse, uh, and that sort of became the focus of my career for many years after that. Uh, we went on and, you know, Alan mentioned that Kate Avies had identified this patient that had a deletion of half of the dystrophin gene. It was more than a one million base pair deletion. That individual had a deletion of exon 17 to 48 and remained ambulant until he died at age 78 many years later. Uh, so we, one of the things we did was we wanted to compare the full length in these mini dystrophins. We made a number of additional transgenic mice using different promoters, different introns, things like that. And we showed that indeed this, uh, this uh, essentially this mini dystrophin, this Becker muscular dystrophy dystrophin, uh, uh, eliminated most of the symptoms in the MDX mouse, but not all of them. And that told us a couple of things. One was that the MDX mouse, and in fact I argue with people about this even today, that the MDX mouse actually is a reasonable model that could discriminate between a very high functional Becker muscular dystrophy cDNA versus the full-length dystrophin cDNA. And a couple of things that came out of this study <coughs> was that uh, we showed, we, we, had, we ended up with a whole bunch of transgenic animals that had a variety of different levels of expression, and we showed that as long as we had at least 20% of normal levels of dystrophin uh, fairly uniformly distributed, we could essentially eliminate dystrophin symptoms. And, and that's really a, a sort of a hallmark that is, is held up today, which is something we're striving to achieve in the clinic. We also show that mosaic expression of dystrophin led to a partial alleviation of the symptoms, but it wasn't nearly as good as uniform expression of dystrophin. Uh, based on that, we began a whole series of studies to look at a variety of uh, functional domains. We did structure function studies of dystrophin. I, I won't go through all this work. We've made dozens and dozens of transgenic animals over the years. Uh, we looked at the actin binding domains. We uh, looked at deletions of the rod domain. We showed that if you, if you eliminate all of the rod domain, dystrophin becomes completely non-functional. Uh, Mike Hauser and others started looking at internal deletions to see how many spectrum-like repeats we could take out of this protein. Uh, Jill Raphael uh, Fortney, who was an early graduate student in my lab, did a tremendous amount of work looking at the carboxy terminal regions of dystrophin, and she showed that we could not remove anything within the cysteine-rich domain or the dystroglycan binding domain without completely inactivating dystrophin. But in contrast, we could make a whole bunch of different deletions in the C-terminal domain of dystrophin, and they were without function in the MDX mouse. We never saw any deleterious impact of removing the carboxy terminal domain. And then Scott Harper came into the lab and uh, picked up an idea that I had first proposed back in 1996, which was to try to combine a lot of these deletions we'd put together, and maybe we could make a dystrophin small enough to fit into these emerging AAV vectors. And we decided to name those, those uh, clones microdystrophin, mainly to try to distinguish them from the mini dystrophins that we had been working on already in our laboratory for many years. <coughs> and so, you know, it was back in 1996, I wrote on a piece of paper and showed it to my lab at lab meeting, uh, the structure of this microdystrophin right here, which many years later was adapted by Sarepta and became their uh, FDA-approved drug last year. And I should point out this same microdystrophin uh, was, uh, is also the one that was adapted by uh, Genathon and Roche in their clinical trials as well. So after discussing this in my lab in 96, I went on and wrote a couple of grant applications on that, uh, one to MDA and one to NIH, and both of those grants were funded, which was, surprised me, because uh, it was a fairly radical concept at the time. 
Uh, the problem we had at the, at the time, we had been going through many different viral vectors, adenovirus, retroviruses, lentiviruses, plasmids, trying to find ways to deliver dystrophin, and we just couldn't find a way to, to get anything to work beyond intramuscular injection. And AAV had attracted a lot of attention because when you did intramuscular injections with AAV, it was, it was quite stable. Uh, Barry Byrne, in fact, was the first one to show that you could get very long-term expression of AAV vectors after intramuscular injection. And people were out there at meetings saying, well, you know, all we have to do is do about 5,000 injections into different muscles throughout the body and we'll cure this disease. And that just, you know, that was never gonna pan out, obviously. But I had this incredible postdoc in my lab, Paul Grigorovich, come to me and say, you know, what we really need to do, we've got to go intravascularly, otherwise we'll never be able to target all the muscles in the body, and maybe what we should do is just a dose escalation and see how much AV can we actually produce in our laboratory, and can we just zap it all into the MBX mouse with a tail vein injection. So he did that, and eventually, after getting up to incredibly high doses of over 10 to the 13th vector genomes per kilogram, Paul was able to show with a variety of reporter genes and some of our earlier microdystrophins that we could actually get body-wide gene delivery to muscle through an intravascular delivery of AAV vectors. And this method uh, has now has gone on and is being used in hundreds of clinical trials worldwide. Uh, once we got to the point where we could deliver microdystrophin body-wide, we are able to start looking at a lot of different organ systems and really ask in detail how functional are these microdystrophins after all. Because one of the problems with microdystrophin is they're only 30% of the size of the full-length protein. I mean, it's really kind of astounding that they work at all. Uh, but we, uh, despite our optimism, we showed there were really some functional deficits of these microdystrophins. For example, we really brought those out by going into very old MDX mice, mice that were at least a year and a half old when they really started developing uh, significant weakness. And we showed that these microdystrophins were able to significantly increase strength, but it never got back to wild type levels. And more concerning, if, uh, in collaboration with Joe Mesker, a former colleague of mine at the University of Michigan, uh, Joe did a lot of cardiac assays and showed that in fact, the microdystrophins seemed to work less well in cardiac muscle than they did in skeletal muscle. And so that prompted us to go on and uh, develop uh, dozens more clones. Uh, we started a long-term collaboration with Dongsheng Duan, who, who's been a colleague of mine for many years. I think between uh, uh, Dr. Duan's lab and my lab, we've tested well over 50 different microdystrophins, trying to optimize them, getting them to work better and better. Uh, and, and some of the newer ones we've made do work significantly better, both in skeletal and cardiac muscle than the original ones. Uh, but none of them are really perfect. So we've tr been trying to find ways for many years to deliver larger and more potent dystrophins. And, and I won't go through all, all of that work. We published more than 10 years ago a method of using homologous recombination to make mini dystrophins. There were some issues with that method. Uh, Dong Cheng had a different method to make large dystrophins. But we've uh, uh, latched onto a newer method recently that's really been uh, the work of a uh, an incredible postdoc of mine, Hisham Tasfayout, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Washington. And Hisham came up with the idea of using split in teens. So the way split in teens work is that you can take uh, different AAV vectors and they produce, you can put different parts of the dystrophin uh, protein in, uh, to be encoded in those vectors. And you put on each end of them uh, two halves of an intene. So it's a split in teen. And the way this works is these two half proteins are produced and then the, the, the split intines come together, they covalently join, they spontaneously excise, and they bring together the outer extine to make these larger proteins. Uh, and it turns out if you put uh, two different vectors together, you can make very potent mini dystrophins, and if you put three different vectors together, you can, re you can reproduce the full length dystrophin uh, in muscle. So how, how well does this, what does this actually work? So here's an example of some of the things we compared. This is a little cartoon of the full length dystrophin. Uh, this is one of the early mini dystrophins we were working on. Uh, this is a new midi dystrophin that Hisham has put together that uh, uh, is larger than the early midi dystrophins. It's larger than the, the mini dystrophin that was in the Becker patient that Kate Avies identified. And this is our, our, our latest and most potent microdystrophin down here, the one being used by solid biosciences. And what we should, the, the other key to this, to, to be able to co-deliver two, two or three different vectors and have them all come together in the same cell requires that they actually uh, co-transduce different cells. And in fact, we had showed that about 10 years ago when, with some of our early uh, dual vector technologies. And we showed that, you know, similar to plasmid transfection, if you, if you take multiple plasmids together, transfect them into cells and tissue culture, a cell that takes up one plasmid generally takes up all the plasmids. Turns out it's the same thing with AV. As long as you get up to a high enough uh, intravascular level uh, that you get uh, efficient extravasation uh, and you get co-transduction of vectors that are mixed together. 
And, uh, but the key to that is really to bring down the vector doses, and that's been a real issue in the clinic lately, right, with, uh, with a lot of problems with innate immune responses uh, against AAV vectors. So a key to this has been the development of new myotropic vectors. This has been uh, led by a, t a couple of different laboratories, uh, Dirk Grimm in Heidelberg and Sharif Tavabordbar have developed myotropic vectors. And here's an example of how they work using this split intine system. This is a delivery of our microdystrophin-5 with AV9 at a fairly low dose. This is about tenfold lower than what's being used in the clinic, and we don't really see significant levels of microdystrophin when we use those low doses. But when we switch over to these myotropic vectors, we get very potent levels of not only the microdystrophin, but also these mini-dystrophins. Uh, this is a systemic delivery into the MDX mouse. You can see microdystrophin delivery, the mini-dystrophin, and full-length dystrophin are being produced at substantial levels at doses that are tenfold lower than what are currently being used in the clinic, and we see an increase in uh, strength of the muscles going from the microdystrophin to the mini-dystrophin to the full-length dystrophin. And here's, uh, I think, some of the most interesting data we've generated today. And I, I should, before I forget, I want to mention the Hisham test file. We'll talk about this in a lot more detail uh, Tuesday afternoon uh, in a talk that he's giving here at the meeting. But in this case, we wanted to look at old NBX mice because they have a lot more weakness than the young mice do. Uh, so Hisham in injected these uh, split intine vectors into 17-month-old MDX mice, waited till they were two years old and did an analysis. And hopefully you can see the overall morphology is significantly improved. We're seeing a reversal of the muscular dystrophy. Looking with trichome straining at fibrosis, we see a significant reduction in fibrosis and decent expression of microdystrophin, considering that a lot of these muscles have lost muscle mass. And so there's not nearly as much muscle to transduce as there is in the young mouse. And this is just a quantification of some of the fibrosis, looking at the level of fibrosis that we see in the 17-month untreated MDX mice, which is the age at which we infuse these dual vectors into these animals. And then we looked at two-year-old mice, and there's a dramatic uh, reduction in fibrosis in these animals after expression of the mini and full-length dystrophins. So I just want to uh, conclude here, and you know, some of the, I think it's fantastic we have uh, AV microdystrophin, the Srepta approval is, is, is an amazing event, uh, but you know, it's not quite where we want to be, I don't think. We need to go beyond that. And some of the problems we're having are the high AV doses lead to innate and acquired immune responses. Lower levels of gene delivery are being seen than what we see in these animal models. Uh, and there are functional limitations of microdystrophin. I, I, I'm going to put forward the idea that we feel these split and teen AVs using myotropic vectors are going to enable delivery of highly functional uh, dystrophins uh, at lower levels than are currently being used in the clinic. And the mini dystrophins that we can put together with two uh, split and teen vectors lead to a dramatic reversal of uh, muscular dystrophy in two year old MDX mice. So I'll stop right there. It's, uh, it's impossible for me to thank all the people that have contributed to this work. Uh, I do want to highlight some special mentors in my career, certainly Steve Hauschka, who has been an incredible uh, uh, mentor, one of the best scientists I've ever met, and one of the most honest and ethical people that, that you'll ever meet in your life. Tom Kasky, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, was uh, my postdoctoral mentor, got me into muscular dystrophy. Lou Kunkel has always been incredibly helpful and friendly to me throughout his career. Kevin Campbell has been uh, just a tremendous friend and advisor for many years. And of course, John Faulkner, who also passed away a few years ago, was just an incredible muscle physiologist. And of course, uh, like Don Wood, I have to acknowledge my wife, Joelle Chamberlain, who has been with me every day. I bounce all my ideas off her. She corrects me. She tells me when I'm wrong. And we've been a, a tremendous partner for for, for more than 30 years and, and trying to develop treatments for muscular dystrophy. Joelle is now focused on dominant muscular dystrophies herself. And then the many people in my laboratory. Uh, I've had more than 50 graduate students and postdocs over the years. Uh, these are the people whose work I highlighted uh, today, starting with Greg Cox and Jill Raphael Fortney, that's two of my earliest graduate students, uh, down to Hisham Tasfayout, uh, my, my had been my most recent postdoc, now an assistant professor at the University of Washington. And of course, once again, I'd like to thank the support, the tremendous support and inspiration by MDA for many years, who've continuously supported me for more than 35 years. And of course, uh, thank you to NIH for all your wonderful grants as well. Thanks.